One thing I have to ask the three of you, because I have mm. both scientists and philosophers on this panel, is I have to ask about why so many physicists are bashing philosophers these days. So to give you a few examples, <laughs> Stephen Hawking in his last book said that uh, philosophy is dead because it hasn't kept up with developments in physics. Uh, Lawrence Krauss mm. and Neil deGrasse Tyson, other high profile physicists, have made very cutting remarks about philosophy, especially philosophy of science. And basically they say this is, uh, you know, just sort of, uh, it's not dealing with the real world. Uh, right. what, and, and David, you have been in the middle of this debate. Uh, <laughs> why is there this, this tension between philosophy and, and physics? I, I'm, I'm not sure I know what to say about that. I mean, there is, um, um, there have been instances for a while where philosophers are pointing out to physicists in one way or another that they're not doing their jobs properly. Um, and, and this is, you know, we, th th there was a very long period during the 20th century um, where if you grew up in a physics education and if you became puzzled about issues at the foundations of quantum mechanics, you were told in very stern language, language that have, could have consequences for your future career if you didn't pay heed to it, um, that physics is, that nowadays we know that physics is not about what the world is like. Physics is about the business of predicting the positions of pointers on, on measuring instruments and, and so on and so forth. And, and if you said something like, okay, um, so which department should I go to if I want to find out what the world is like? Because I thought <laughs> that's what <laughs> physicists were doing. Um, this would be diagnosed as a, as a worrisome sign of intellectual immaturity and, uh, <laughs> and, and so on and so forth. And there was a very long period of people on various edges of physics and philosophers saying, gee, we thought the project here was to tell us in some fairly straightforward, realistically understandable sense what the world is like. But you know, uh, the criticism that physicists often level against philosophers is f contemporary philosophy doesn't add anything to our knowledge of the world. It doesn't add any science to the world. Yeah, you ask some good questions, but you're, you're not well, contributing I mean, but, but, to but knowledge. So there are two things to say about that. One thing to say is, I mean, and these two things pull in sort of opposite directions. Here's the, the less interesting thing to say about that is, what the hell kind of a question is that? So what if you ask, <laughs> what if you ask physicists what they've done for music lately? You know? I, I don't know. We're doing physics. We're not doing music. We're do this is what we're interested in doing. But, um, but, but th there's a more serious thing to say, which is that what's been interesting for many, many years, going back at least to the scientific revolution, is that there has been a boundary between between physics and philosophy across which they're yelling at each other and accusing each other of things and asking each other very interesting questions, which has been enormously productive. I mean, if everybody now acknowledges, for example, that if it hadn't been for the Machian analysis of the role that time plays in classical mechanics, Einstein never would have come up with the special theory of relativity. Einstein is very much upfront about this in, in the way he talked about it. And more recently, I think it's fair to say that all sorts of developments that have come very much into the mainstream of physics, like the whole field of quantum computation, for example, was as a historical matter, a fairly direct spin-off of people, mostly people in the philosophy community or close to the philosophy community, thinking about issues about uh, how to solve the measurement problem. And these issues we were talking about with Everettian interpretations of quantum mechanics and so on and so forth. So, I mean, th there, there are going to be historical eras where physics defines itself in a certain way, which involves forgetting what it's portfolio really is. And, so I, and, want, I want to bring Jim into this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Physics and philosophy, what, what do you make of this tension? Uh, well, to begin with, Neil was uh, bashing his fellow physicists uh, just a moment ago mm. along largely philosophical lines. They're not listening to nature's message. I'm simple. That's right. Uh, secondly, uh, most physicists 
when you when when uh, if you mention philosophy of science to them, they think, oh, Karl Popper, uh, right. Thomas Kuhn. <laughs> they <have> never <laughs> they don't have no idea what it's about. That's right. Thirdly, they have disagreements, like the disagreement between uh, uh, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking about whether we need a physical process that collapses the wave, wave function. function. Hawking says, I'm a positivist. I, all I care about are the measurements. And Penrose says, no, 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 physics, like David, you know, it should give us a picture of reality. Therefore, I have to find a physical mm -hmm. mechanism. And it has to do with quantum gravity, I think. Mm -hmm. So this is a real philosophical disagreement. Mm -hmm. Finally, I would say that even within physics, the, so philosophers are sort of like theoretical physicists, and physicists are like experimental physicists. Uh, experimental <laughs> physicists don't like theoretical physicists because what are they doing? All this sort of mathematical noodling, and they don't really, they don't work at all. Like we're, you know, we're getting these results, and they, the joke is that experimental physicists will say theoretical physicists will never schedule a meeting on Wednesday because it spoils two weekends. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.